All right. Um, that doesn't count as my time. <laughs> oh, good. That added to my time. Good deal. All right. All right. I would like to assume, and I know it's not a good thing to do, that, that most of you are probably full predators. All right. It's probably why you're here. Maybe you're here investigating. That's great, too. Um, as I said earlier, preterism is an eschatology, and it's really more than that. It is a hermeneutic. It helps us understand how to interpret the Bible. We know what time it is. It, it can make a big difference. But what is troubling to me is that under the banner of preterists are all kinds of aberrant doctrinal views. And Brian, and Maria, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm going to try to be soft here, okay? But <laughs> I think we need to be careful in embracing someone just because they say they're a preterist. It's like, I don't believe anything that's doctrinally sound, but I believe the Lord returned in 87. And we'd be like, oh, we welcome them. And I, you know, we have to use a little wisdom, people. We have to use caution. And I, I'm all for getting along with everybody the best you can. I'm not for separating from people because you don't agree on certain things. I like the disagreements. I, that's how I learn. If you disagree with me, I want to know what you believe, how you believe that. And that helps me change my views sometimes. I've changed many of views because people have confronted me on things, you know. But there's some things that are just set in stone and I'm not, you know, okay. So we just, just, we just have to be careful. And because sometimes it gets to the point that I don't even want to associate with the term preterist because there's so many crazy people out there, you know. I mean, my eschatology is definitely fulfilled eschatology, but there's some within the movement that really give it a bad name. And when these people who hold these very unbiblical view, views call themselves preterist, I just don't want to be associated with that. Now, that being said, my message for today is polemic, okay? What I want to look at in our time together is who are the Gentiles? And I think this is an important subject because there are, there's a group within preterism that say the Gentiles refers only to the 10 northern tribes of Israel. And thus the Bible is written solely to the nation Israel. And therefore... There's nothing in it for us. It's all about Israel. They also believe that everything ended in 8070. And I mean everything, which includes salvation, sin, spiritual death, the church, the law. You know, <laughs> the thing I don't understand is if you believe that's true, why do you even bother with the Bible? I mean, I mean, I understand you're studying to the point. Now I realize none of it's for me. Good, then throw it out and go on with your miserable life. And I'm not trying to be mean. <laughs> you know? But once you realize it doesn't apply to you, you know, you, you've got a miserable life because you just gave up on the Bible. It has nothing for you. There's no salvation. There's no hope. And that's a miserable life. I believe that Yahweh has today and always has a plan, for, always had a plan for the Gentiles. I believe he loves Gentiles, and I'm using Gentiles not as the 10 northern tribes, okay? I believe he saves them. I believe the Bible is the word of the living God, and I believe it's relevant to us today. It'd be kind of stupid to do what I do if I didn't believe that, wouldn't it? And that's why I just, you know, I'm, it's still a mystery to me, these Israel-only people. I'm like, just go away. You know, why do you want to ruin it for us by trying to tell us we're supposed to believe? You need to believe what I believe and therefore quit believing anything. No. And I'll tell you what's sad. In, in 13, 2013, at Don Preston's conference, one of the speakers got up and preached this Israel-only doctrine. Now, Don did not know about it, and he was very upset about it. And I went to him afterwards, and I said, you need to stop spreading that garbage. I said, you got no busy, you know, and we, we, we just, he since has repented and fixed that, you know, but it was, it's confusing to people and it's damaging. 
So let's start at the beginning. Now, I'm gonna ask you to be a Berean. If this material is new to you, I'm not asking you to accept it, but I'm asking that you don't reject it. I'm asking that you look at it and do some research, okay? Just be a Berean. That's what we're called to do. In Genesis, we learn that the first man, Adam, I know that might be a different view now, but I believe that Adam was the first man. He was created by God. He was brought into Eden, which was the cosmic mountain, was the dwelling place of Yahweh, the place where Yahweh holds counsel. So Adam was brought into the garden. He was brought into an intimate relationship with Yahweh and with the divine counsel. Now, if you're not familiar with the divine counsel view, I can't really catch up on that right now, but you know, we have plenty of stuff on our website about it. Adam and Eve walked with God in the garden. They dwelt in his presence. You know what happened next? Man's tempted and he falls. Now, here's what's interesting to me. The book of Jubilees says that Adam was in the garden for seven years before he sinned. I love that because I'm like, you read the Bible and it's like, okay, God puts him in the garden. Don't do this. Boom. Next second he's out. I'm like, dude, we didn't stand a chance, man. It just that quick. You know, you couldn't have hang on a little bit. So seven years, it makes you feel like, okay, you know, he, he made a little effort there. So what caused man to sin? Well, the text says it was the serpent who tempted Eve in Revelation 12, nine connects the serpent with Satan. All right. So the divine being Satan, who I believe was a member of the divine council, and I believe he was jealous of man. The divine council was fellowshipping with God in the garden. God brings man in, and they're like, mm, no, we don't need men in this fellowship. We don't want them. So they were jealous. So he got him to sin. You know, I could get him to sin. Yahweh will kick him out of the garden. We'll go back to the way things were. Now, notice Yahweh's promise to, uh, after the fall of Adam and Eve, now I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Eve's seed, a human being, will come and fix what Adam has done. A deliverer will come. It's my understanding that the gods understood this promise of a coming redeemer who would be human. So the gods strategized and said, we got to stop this. What do we do to destroy the human race? How can we corrupt the human race genetically so that the Messiah cannot come through the human line and I think we see this in Genesis chapter 6. Now, to most Christians, the event of Genesis 3 is the sole reason that mankind is evil. When you ask any Christian, why is mankind bad? Why is mankind evil? Genesis 3, the fall. But to a second temple Hebrew, this was only one of three events that caused man to be so sinful. And to them, the event of Genesis 3 was actually low on the list. Now, let me give you a quote from Michael Heiser, who is a Bible scholar. He's got a PhD in Hebrew Bible and ancient Semitic languages. Heiser says this, and I think it's so important for understanding when we grasp this. He says 99% of Second Temple Judaism. And by that, he's referring to their literature. You know, they didn't go around and do a poll with every, you know, Jew, what do you think about this? No, this is their literature. This is their writings. 99% believe that the reason wickedness so permeates the earth is not just an extension and in large part not even linked to what happened to Adam and Eve, but the reason that people are always and universally thoroughly wicked is because of what the watchers did. Everybody in Paul's circle, everybody in Second Temple Judaism, with the exception of four intertestamental references in intertestamental literature, everything says the reason for the proliferation of evil is the sin of the watchers, everything. I think that's, you know, this is their literature. This is what they believe. So the watchers' next strategic move was an attempt to destroy the human race by genetically corrupting the human line. And I think that's what's happening in Genesis 6. Now, it came about when man began to multiply in the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whoever they chose. Then Yahweh said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he is also in the flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 100. 
and 20 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. I got to try to stay on key, and this is so hard here, but I, I got, I have to, I have to say this. Okay. Um, women, hopefully your men inform you of this and uh, parents need to inform their children. Men have a problem with lust. Okay. And it's physically driven. I mean, spiritually driven. We look at things and it, you know, women don't operate on the same wavelength, so they don't get it. But here's, I try to use this as an illustration. Here's how powerful lust is. Angels of God, watchers left heaven. To come down because of their lust for women. And so I say that to say, women, please dress in a way that is appropriate. You know, I mean, today it just, I don't know, it's, I just don't see how yoga pants are modest. I don't care <laughs> who puts them on. You know, it's like wearing spray paint out. You know, so, but we just, and I'm not saying put on a burqa. Okay, but I'm saying dress in a way that is not, you know, causing men to lust for you. All right. All right. That doesn't count either in my time. <laughs> <laughs> the sons of God in verse two and verse four, I believe are rebellious divine beings. They were part of God's heavenly host. They were called the watchers. They've taken the form of masculine human like creatures. And these gods married women of the human race. And they violated the heavenly earthly division that Yahweh had established. And the hybrid offspring of this abominable union was the giants called Nephilim. Now Enoch says that the flood was sent because of the watchers. The voluntary sexual transgression of the women, which the watchers was a violation of heaven and earth. It caused humans to share the blame. The wickedness of men was their sexual union with these watchers. Now, Enochian texts of the intertestamental period and the New Testament tell us that these watchers did two things to disrupt God's plan. Number one, they raised up a seed to corrupt God's people. In other words, we're going to corrupt the human line. The Messiah can't come through this line. Secondly, they helped humanity destroy themselves. The book of Enoch is fantastic with this, talking about what the watchers taught men. They taught, them things, they taught us things we're not supposed to know, things to corrupt us, all right? So we have Satan corrupting man in the garden. Then we have the watchers, the sons of God, corrupting the gene pool with the hybrid beings, and which are the Nephilim, corrupting and destroying humans in Genesis 6. What we need to understand is that this second temple literature is the context of the New Testament. This is the context. All the biblical writers were familiar and influenced by second temple literature. This was in their heads. And the context of the Bible is the people who produced it. Right? We got to understand. We got to get in the mind of the Israelites and understand what did they think? What did that mean to them? How did they understand this? When we read the New Testament, we must perceive and consider it like a first century Jew would. We have to have their supernatural worldview in our heads. Now, from the writings of Second Temple period, we see that they believe that the reason that wickedness so permeates the earth was a result of three incidents, all right? The fall of Adam and Eve. We all know that one, right? We got that one down. The second one, the sin of the watchers in Genesis 6. What's the third one? Thank you. The Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. Because of Genesis 3, the fall, and Genesis 6, Men were evil. They're disobedient to Yahweh. And in Genesis 11, it reached the summit in the Tower of Babel. In Genesis 10, the Tower of Babel, the pseudopigraph of literature says the base was 200 miles square. This is a big deal, this ziggurat they're building, okay? They're trying to get to God, to dethrone God. They're building this thing to get to the heavens, all right? In Genesis 10, we have the Table of Nations. Yahweh divides Noah's descendants into 70 different nations. Okay, keep that in your mind, 70. That's an important number. This is recorded in Genesis 10, 32. These are the clans of the sons of Noah, according to their genealogies, in their nations, and from these nations spread abroad on the earth after the flood. Now, it's important to note 
that Israel is not listed in the index of 70 nations found in Genesis 10. Why? They didn't exist, okay? So it's hard to put them in that list when they don't, they're not on the scene yet. The nation Israel didn't exist. Now, what happens at Babel is man's disobedience causes Yahweh to divide them up and give them to the lesser gods. God has been working with man since Adam, all right, through these years. You know, the man keeps sinning, they keep going away, they keep wanting to worship other gods. And so God finally says, I'm done. I've had it with you people. You want to worship these gods? You go ahead. And God divided up the nations and he put these gods over them. So God, Yahweh says, you want to serve them? You go ahead. You serve them. And he put them under them. Basically, he's done. He's washing his hands on humankind. What happened in Genesis 10, 11 is explained in Deuteronomy 32, verse 8, 9. It says, when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, this is talking about Genesis 10, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the people according to the number of the sons of God. That's important. The ESV brings that out. Other translations that, you know, say sons of Israel. Again, Israel didn't exist. Can't be that. And if you go into the, you know, dig into this a little bit, um, <clears throat> the Septuagint, um, other texts, you find out that it is sons of God. That's what it's talking about here. It's talking about these divine beings. He put these divine beings over these nations and he fixed the borders. And you see this in scripture. You know, when they're in a battle, well, well, that's the God of the hills. So we're not doing so well because we got a God of the plains. They had divided up these little gods. These gods had their little nations and their people under them, and they were worshiping them. Uh, and in fact, in uh, variations of the same Hebrew root, par the word parad, divided, are used in Genesis 10.32 and Deuteronomy 32. He gave the nations their inheritance. Now, up to Genesis 11... There's no Jew or Gentile. There's just people who are sinners. Then in chapter 12, Yahweh calls Abraham as his people, and he starts a new family. Now, you probably heard it said that Abraham was a pagan moon worshiper. I don't think so. I think he was a worshiper of Yahweh. And the pseudepigrapha text, and I searched for it, and I couldn't find it. I hate when that happens. But there's a text in the Pseudepigrapha that says Abraham loved the Lord from three years old on. So I, I think he probably did. Well, he chooses Abraham. All right. I'm going to start a new family. And Israel becomes a nation at Sinai when Yahweh gave them his law and he enters into covenant with them. They were called the house of Israel. Exodus 49, 38. Jacob married two sisters, Leah and Rachel. These two women and their maids, they, we get 12 sons who were the 12 tribes of Israel. They remained united until after the death of Solomon. I think you're all pretty familiar with that. When Solomon died, 925 or 926 BC, the Northerners refused to recognize his successor, Rehoboam. Subsequently, the North broke away and was ruled by the House of Om Omri. <clears throat> the Northern Kingdom of Israel flourished until it was completely destroyed and its 10 tribes sent into permanent exile by the Assyrians between 740 and 721 BC. So the House of Israel split into two kingdoms. The 10 northern tribes were known as the House of Israel. The, the two southern tribes were known as the Southern Kingdom or Judah. When the northern tribes went to Assyri into Assyrian captivity, they lost their identity as Israelites. They became identifiable only as part of the nations. The Lord said, Ezekiel 4.13, the Lord said, Yahweh said, Thus shall the people of Israel eat their bread unclean among the nations where I will drive them. So the northern tribes are part of the nations now. Hosea 8.8, 8, Israel is swallowed up. Already they are among the nations as a useless vessel. They're swallowed up. They're part of the nation. So Israel is among the nations, which here refers to the non-Israelites. She's been swallowed up. But Yahweh promises that one day the two houses are going to be united. Isaiah 11, 11 and 12. In that day, the Lord will extend his hand yet a second time, this is the second exodus, to recover the remnant that remains of his people from Assyria, Egypt, Pathos, Cush, Elam, Sinar, Hamath, 
and from the coastlands of the sea. He will raise a signal for the nations and will assemble the banished of Israel and gather the dispersed from Judah in the four corners of the earth. Or he's going to assemble the banished, those that are dispersed of Judah. So the Assyrians had scattered them, but Yahweh promised to regather. Yahweh says that there's going to be a time to regather Israel, the ten northern tribes of Judah, and Judah, the southern kingdoms. Now watch the next verse. The jealousy of Ephraim shall depart, and those who harass Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not be jealous of Judah, and Judah shall not harass Ephraim. Ephraim is Samaria. There's going to be a time of peace between Israel and Judah. Yeshua is this peace. Now let me make this clear. The northern kingdom of Israel is included in the term nations or Gentiles. All right, there's no question the 10 northern tribes are associated as that, but not exclusively. And this is what I.O. tries to promote, the, the Israel-only doctrine, that the nations, the Gentiles, I mean, these 10 northern tribes are called Gentiles. They're ethnos, all right? And that's the only people that are. Well, that's not true. And if you look at the scripture and you compare these terms, you see that the Greek term ethnos can be used of the 10 northern tribes. There's no, that, we see that I think in Romans 9, 24, <clears throat> even us whom he has called not from the Jews only, but from the Gentiles. Now, let me say here, the Gentiles is a bad translation. It is the English language substitution for the Hebrew word goi, sing, which is singular and goyim, which is plural. And the Greek words ethne, singular, and ethnos, plural. The word is best translated as nations. And that represents sometimes the nation of Israel. Israel's called goy. They're called ethnos at times. This word is best translated, though, like I said, as nations. And sometimes this word is used for the ten northern tribes. But sometimes it's used for non-Israelites. And sometimes it's used for everybody, as in all nations. Paul says that the called are not from the Jews only, but from the ethnos. Now, what does Paul mean by this? Well, most see this as saying that God only chooses some from Israel to be vessels of mercy, but he chooses, but he also chooses some from the Gentiles. Now, I don't think that what Paul is saying here is the word Gentiles is from the Greek ethnos, which is much better, like I said, translated nations. Chapters 9 through 11 of Romans are all about Israel. And I think that what Paul says here is dealing with Israel, the 10 northern tribes. The Gentiles, Paul's referring to here, are mentioned in Hosea 1.10. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, it shall be said to them, children of the living God. Now, these Gentiles are identified as children of Israel. So Paul called Israelites, the 10 northern tribes, ethnos. Romans 9, 26, Hosea 1, 10 are referring to the same people. So at times, the 10 northern tribes are called goi or ethnos, but these terms are not exclusive for the northern kingdom of Israel. And the Israel-only group would have us believe that, that it's exclusive for them. But for example, Mark 10:33 saying, see, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. Here, ethnos is not referring to the northern kingdom of Israel. It's the Romans who were non-Israelites, okay? People, we have to identify our terms, and we have to see how it's used. Don't, you know, Again, they'll tr Israel will try to prove, well, ethnos is used of the 10 North. They're right there. Or they're like a, bro a broke clock. They're only right twice a day, okay? You know, they're wrong on the rest of the stuff. Acts 4.27 says, For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant, Yeshua, whom you anointed, both Herod pa and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and all the peoples of Israel. Here, Gentiles is a distinct group from Israel, and ethnos here refers to non-Israelites. Just stop me whenever. Okay, cool, cool. Thank you. Whew. I'm stressing up here. like, I'm never. <laughs> but the Lord said, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Paul was to take the gospel to the nations 
and to the sons of Israel. So sometimes nations is used of the nation Israel, sometimes of the dispersed 10 northern tribes, and sometimes for non-Israelites. Its meaning has to be determined by the context. You've got to look at the context. And we saw that the Tower of Babel, Yahweh disinherited how many nations? 70. He chose Israel as his people. When we come to the New Testament, we see at Pentecost that Yahweh begins to reclaim the nations that he has disinherited for himself. Yahweh, in other words, had not forever abandoned the nations to the watchers. Look at Luke 10, 1. Now, after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them into pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. What's significant about 70? Well, remember the number of nations listed in the table of nations in Genesis 10 that Yahweh disinherited was 70. And now he says, let's go call, send, send out 70. And Luke viewed the gospel as God's plan for reclaiming the nations. The disinherited at Babel matches the number of disciples in Luke 10.1. It was meant to symbolize, to show what the Lord was doing in this. Now, the number 70 has great theological significance in the context of the Canaanite religion. Ancient Ugaric texts provide evidence that the Canaanites believed there were 70 sons of El. This is all connected, you know, with Israel. For the Israelites, the number 70 was symbolic of Yahweh's choice of them as the chosen people over the nations of the world. Now, Yahweh's inauguration of the kingdom meant that these 70 disinherited nations, which are called ethnos, were being reclaimed. Sending out 70 disciples expressed this theological message. The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I've given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, nothing will injure you. In conjunction with the successful mission of the 70, Yeshua declared the expulsion of Satan from God's presence. Satan is being defeated, and the nations are being made part of the kingdom of God. So who are the Gentiles? Well, the word is best translated as nations, representing sometimes the nation of Israel, sometimes the dispersed ten northern tribes, sometimes non-Israelites. And sometimes everybody. Again, its meaning has to be determined by the context, which means we have to do our homework. I know I lost you there, right? It cost me work. We got to work. Yes, we got to figure out the context. Sometimes the translation Gentiles is helpful. Sometimes it's not. When I use the term Gentile, I mean not Israelite. So the body of Christ people is made up of the regathered 12 tribes of Israel and many non-Israelites who have been called of Yahweh and trusted in Christ. All right, that's part one. Now we're gonna, I'm gonna go on in later on this afternoon and get into part two and thanks for the extra five minutes. All right, I've got 30 minutes on my clock, so. All right, thank you, appreciate you listening. <laughs>